A while ago, a Christian songwriter wrote a song about it doesn't matter who you are, you gotta serve somebody. And that is true for all of us. All of us serve somebody. Regardless of who we are, we all give our lives to something. And so if you're asking that question, stick around this morning, and in just a few moments, Pastor Mike is gonna be looking at that question and asking us to reflect on that. So stick around, be a part of the service. We are just so glad that you are here with us this morning. Say hello in the comments and interact with us, sing along and be a part of what God has for us this morning. Make sure you check us out on sgbic.com and find out more ways in which you can get involved, be a part of a life group, or just learn how we can pray for you or you can pray for us and be a part of what God is doing here in Rancho Cucamonga and around the world. Because God is up to something really good. I know this week we've got youth group. There are awesome things happening here at the church in the school and Hidden Oaks. And God is up to something. And I just want to say thank you so much for all of your prayers and support that you help make all of this possible. Thank you so much. And so as we continue in worship, let me pray for this morning and pray for all of the ways in which we give and support what God is doing. God, I thank you so much for this morning. And I thank you for the privilege of being here together where we get to invest and be a part of what you are doing. God, I thank you for all of the ways that you are moving in our midst, changing our lives, changing our community, and changing each and every one of us. And so God, enter in and speak to us this morning through the prayers, through the worship, and through Mike's message. May we be challenged and transformed this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you you 
before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you Hey everyone, wanted to let you know I'm growing more comfortable having awkward conversations. You're probably wondering that, right? <laughs> After the past couple years, taking little baby steps towards holding my own in awkward conversations and also just not being tossed around so much in them. And a few months ago, I found myself taking in the letter of Titus which has a few awkward things in there that spark awkward conversations for us. And uh, for our purposes today, we can get to some of that in the coming weeks. We'll, we, won't go, we won't go through the, this letter. It's only three chapters. We won't go through, um, we won't go through verse by verse. But um, the, today I want to just focus on the introduction to Titus in this ancient Greek letter. Um, it's remarkable to me how much these can be similar to Twitter because not, not in angry rants and lots of spamming of ideas, but parchment was precious in ancient, in the first century. And uh, it, so the space mattered. And uh, the author of this letter, uh, I think it was Paul, uh, writing to Titus, had to pack a lot of ideas into a very small amount of space. And just check out this first verse, uh, the first half of it. The, this letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm well, just mentioning that word, <laughs> a slave of God. Uh, that jumped off the page at me. Uh, because I grew up in a church where before you got baptized, you would say your confession of faith was Jesus is the Lord of my life. But I started looking at this. I looked up the, the original language and it really is slave. Doulos is the Greek word, a slave of God. And as I started chewing on that, I kept thinking like, we're all going to serve something. We're all going to, we're all going to wind up having our allegiance towards something in this life. And Paul chose to, to address himself, to name himself as a slave of God. In other translations, it says a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I started thinking, what am I serving? Where am I investing my time? What am I investing my time into? Where am I investing my eyeballs and my affections? And it uh, well, if I can tell you about the voices in my head, it prompted some awkward conversations inside my head. I love sports. Oh my goodness, I love sports. I love football. I love the pointy kind of football. I love the round kind of football. I love all the sportsing. I was thinking, oh my goodness, just taking an inventory of my podcasts. I'm like, okay, there's this pastor. I know you guys listen to other pastors too. That's okay. Uh, we've got about 12, 12 different pastors I listen to on my podcast app and my phone. But then I was like, okay, how many sports podcasts do I have? And there's nothing bad about sports podcasts. But I'm thinking, am I serving sports? Is sports becoming an idol in my life? Or am I serving Jesus? Jesus, the words of Jesus. In Mark 8.34, he says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's, that's where my mind went. Like, am I, it, it does, do my podcast inventory is a silly little inventory. Does that indicate that I'm following Jesus? Uh, or is Jesus just one of the things that I follow with all my different sports allegiances to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, LA Lakers, they're all spread all over the place. Uh, Aston Villa in, in England. But does that indicate that I'm following Jesus? 
then I started thinking about following Jesus. Those words, the, they're, they're important to the original recipients. Imagine Jesus in the flesh looking you in the eyes and saying, come follow me. These are the first words Jesus spoke to Peter, the apostle Peter. They're the last words Jesus spoke that we have recorded to Peter, follow me. And Paul says, he's, he's, he's taking it to another level. He calls himself a slave to Christ. And I think when he says that, he's saying, I'm not a slave to anything else other than Jesus. I'm gonna choose what I serve. I have a say in who I serve, and it's Jesus. Not, not greed, not money, not drink, not reputation, not, not accomplishments. I'm a slave to Jesus, and that challenged me is a Jesus follower. And then he continues, we're still in the first verse here of Titus. The second half of the first verse, he says, I have been sent to proclaim this faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. That piqued my interest too. How do, I wanna live a godly life. I've, I'm, I'm all in. I wanna, I, I, let's get to the good part, Paul. I want to live a godly life, and I, uh, if you're not a Jesus follower, and maybe you're here because you want to be a good person, or you 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 maybe were raised in church, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm following there. I'm interested in a godly life. So I'm thinking, what comes next? Like, what's Paul going to say? Is he going to give us nine steps towards living a godly life, or or three keys toward living a more righteous, pious life, or or it's, since it's 2022, maybe one amazing life hack to get rid of all my faults. But Paul doesn't give us formulas. Jesus didn't give us formulas. You want to follow me? Take up your cross. It's a pretty simple formula. Die. <laughs> it, it sounds morbid when you talk about that, but it's a daily, moment by moment, turning our heart back to God. Our affections, our attentions, our actions, our words, it's all encompassing. Paul doesn't give us formulas. He frames all of this in, in a narrative of the big story of God. So if you wanna live a godly life, okay, we gotta start from the beginning. We gotta start from the big story if you wanna know how your little story is supposed to go. So before we get there, like, what do well-meaning adults often say to kids when they want to make conversation? Great open-ended question. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up, kid? And the kid will say, you know, a fireman, police officer, don't ask my son. He watches YouTube a lot. He'll give you some wild answers. Yeah, an influencer. Uh, we're working on that. We're working on the screen time. But it, it shows how kids have at least a, a two-stage view of life. There's childhood, and then there's adulthood. That's how I was when I was a kid. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm 44 years old now, and I still think, ooh, what do I wanna be when I grow up? So that's similar to how the ancient Jews in the first century viewed the world. There was this age, and then there was the age to come. Paul shares that worldview, and he, he incorporates it right here into the introduction in Titus. So he's saying, okay, you wanna live a godly life? Let's set the framework for this. So we've got to talk about this. He says, this truth gives us confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. So there's some things in there. And it's, it's language that, that we don't always use in, um, in constructions. We don't always use in English. But there's ideas in here, and they're huge when you consider the context to the original recipients of this letter uh, that Titus was to go talk to. They're on the island of Crete. They're Cretans. Awkward conversation. Paul calls them liars. They probably didn't like Paul very much, but huge because in there he says, we have confidence that like this is the truth that, that God's promised before the world began. God promised the ancient Israelites that, that there would be this age and an age to come. And the Israelites were, were praying and working and, and striving for the age to come. And then when Jesus came in the flesh, died and crucified and, and God raised him from the dead, that was the coming of the age to come. And, and especially in this period, the dust was still settling and 
a lot of the Jews were kind of on the fence, like, okay, is this really the age to come? But in here, Paul's left a little Easter egg to the Cretans, saying like, we can have confidence in this. Um, the Cretans believed that they actually came from the ground. They were the original Greeks, and that a lot of the gods in their pantheon uh, actually came from Crete or resided in Crete. They believed Zeus, who was known as a liar. So this is a little dig at Zeus that Paul's slipping in there. Uh, Paul's saying the, the God, the one true God, the God of Israel, you can rely on this God. Imagine the good news this has to be for a pagan where there's, there's gods that are out there, but you never know if they're angry with you. You never know if they're pleased with you. Maybe they've just taken a liking to you, but you don't know what you did. You don't know what to keep doing. But the one true God, we can have confidence. This one true God that created all of the universe that we know made himself known in Jesus Christ. He was reliable. God is reliable. God is trustworthy. This means no more walking on eggshells, trying to give the right sacrifice at the right place at the right time. Like This is really good news to them, and it's still good news to us today. We can serve a God. A God that is reliable and trustworthy is inviting you and me to follow him in every area of our lives. That is really good news. And Paul continues talking about this grand narrative, this big story of God in verse 3. And now, at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone. It is by the command of God, our Savior, that I have been entrusted with this work for him. So, like I said, a lot of this is packed in. Paul is saying this age to come that the, the Jewish folks were waiting for, it's here God has dragged the future into the present. I love that phrase. Into this normal, everyday, eating, drinking, talking, walking around, working, playing life. The kingdom of God is here with this whole new quality of life. So I realize what Paul is doing here, it's like trying to sketch a whole entire country just to give context to show where the village that we live in is. So he's talking about these big ideas. He said the, the universe, God is putting all of this together because Jesus came and Jesus is at work doing it now. And then he continues uh, in the introduction. I am writing to Titus, my true son in the faith that we share. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior give you grace and peace. This is, a, I love, a lot of church traditions will say this, that's like a greeting you say when you, you see someone or when you leave someone, grace and peace to you. I love that, grace and peace to you. But in here, if we're just reading in English, we can miss a little, another little dig Paul's got here. He's, he, he's putting all kinds of little pokey things in this letter. In English, where do we, gra we graze right past the word savior? And I, I do love that translation because notice in the first verse, he calls himself a slave to God, a slave to Jesus. But now he's, he's saying, he, but he's my savior. It's both. And, and it, it, it's two different ideas. He serves the good shepherd. He's a servant of the best boss. He's our savior. And this is, a, this is a politically subversive save, um, statement too because that term savior in the ancient world was reserved for Caesar. Caesar came up with the story wanting to be worshiped as a god because Caesar saved the world from chaos. Caesar saved the world for, from war. They would send heralds into all the corners of, of the Roman Empire saying, there's good news, I have a gospel for you, a good news. We've defeated this enemy or defeated that enemy. Paul's using the same term here for Jesus. No, no, you guys, it's not Caesar that saved the world from anarchy. And there were a lot of places in the Roman Empire that would hear that and they'd be like, yeah, uh, totally, Caesar saved the world from chaos, war, and anarchy. No, Paul's saying Jesus is the one who has saved, is saving, and will save 
the world. And there's the same t terms appear in other letters, First and Second Timothy, um, uh, and this term slave of God and apostle appear all over. In the early church, they believed that Jesus saved the world from ultimate chaos and death, and it wasn't Caesar. So you have a say in who you serve. You have a say in what you serve. We don't have control of a lot of different things in our life. The economy, what, peop what other people do, what other people say about us, what other people think about us. But we have a say in what we're going to give our attention to. And that's, that's what I think Jesus means when he says, take up your cross and follow me. We have a say in which story we're going to believe. Are we going to believe the story that says we are, we're responsible for our own happiness? Are we going to believe the story that says oh, somehow happiness is, is inside of me or the answers are all inside of, of ourselves? Or are we going to believe God's story that says the new world has broken into the old, that the kingdom of God is right under our noses, the age to come is here because God's promise to the ancient people of Israel and their faith, that came true. Jesus came back to life. Are we going to believe the story that says God is reliable? Will we believe the story that says Jesus is where our hope is? Not in Caesar or not in the Caesars of our modern world, it's Jesus. So you may be asking yourself by now, okay, Mike, what is the point to all of this? Well, when you see your life through the perspective of God's big story, to me, Jesus is the only option that makes sense, following Jesus. He's the good shepherd. He's called that over and over again in the New Testament. And serving the other gods of this world, modern day gods of the title, money, accomplishments, uh, my own effort, um, what, what the world says you need to do, what our culture says you need to do to be a big deal or have a, a life of, of meaning, that's a roller coaster ride. If your peace is based on those things, if we don't turn over control of our lives to God, we will serve an unreliable master. When you, when you have an experience with Jesus, when you realize what God has done for us, what Jesus sacrificed for us, and it begins to change your heart. There's this life change that I love seeing. That's a, it's this move from a laser beam focus on self-gratification to a life of self-sacrifice. That's the irony of how God works. When we get our eyes off of ourselves, put our eyes on Jesus, our eyes are open to serving others and living for something bigger than just our own pleasures, our own reputation. And the irony is that there's more fulfillment in serving others. There's more fulfillment in being a slave to Jesus, a servant of Jesus, than anything else. Another thing I wanted to just say, that if the Cretans needed to know that the God of Israel was trustworthy, so do we. Maybe you're here because you're, you're thinking about giving God another chance. Maybe you, maybe you grew up in church or, um, and, and graduated from the faith when you graduated high school, or maybe you got hurt in church. Maybe there was a relational dysfunction that just left you shattered, but something brought you here to this YouTube video. Will you give God another chance? If that's you, I want to challenge you to pray a bold prayer, and that's just get alone, no one else around, and just honestly ask, God, will you make yourself real to me? God, will you prove that you are the God I hope you are? I've had to do that in a number of times in my life. You know, laying in bed, can't sleep, mind's racing, tightening in my gut, like mulling over a problem or a conflict in my life and having those doubts, having those moments and just saying, God, is this real? And I don't see fireworks in the sky or, or messages. I don't always hear a voice. But I, in those seasons in my life, 
God has proved himself to me. Sometimes it looks like a text from someone across the world saying, hey, I'm praying for you. You all right? Like, what? <laughs> I just prayed. Uh, sometimes it's immediate. Or sometimes it's just giving that doubt or giving, giving over control of a, a circumstance or an outcome over to God. God, please make yourself real to me. Prove to me that you are the God I know you are. And sometimes I don't get the result I want. But in, in that process, there's peace. In that process of people coming around my family during hard times or around me individually, God sometimes shows off and says, yeah, I'll take you through the storm. I'll take you through this circumstance. And this uh, introduction also inspired me to ask myself, where is my allegiance? I want to ask you, I think Paul would ask you. He says, I'm a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus. I'm the herald, the messenger saying that the kingdom of God is here. Where is your allegiance? See, unlike Caesar, Jesus doesn't demand you to follow him. It's an invitation. Jesus doesn't lead like Caesar did with power and authority and a sword. It's an invitation. Come follow me. Jesus doesn't lead like modern day leaders in politics or business. It's an invitation. It's gentle. He doesn't lead like the ancient gods <laughs> or the, the gods of the modern world. Violence, money, erotic love. Like for Jesus followers, this is an extremely important question. Where is your allegiance? You know, doing, doing a little audit for myself. I'm like, wow. I really love my favorite soccer team. I really love the LA Lakers. I'm proud to stand up in a conversation like, oh, I like, I like this team. I like that team. But in my, what does the rest of my life say? Could people look at me uh, from the outside and say, oh, there's a guy who's really following Jesus. And if we go along with our culture and continue to serve the false gods of erotic love, Money, greed, violence, individualism, the list goes on and on and on. We will stay on that roller coaster ride in our search for meaning and significance and peace. Living a life bigger than yourself, living a life of significance only comes when you attach to your, your life to God's big story. And it's an invitation. Come follow me. So I wanna challenge you to do an audit of your allegiances this week. Think about the things you're passionate about. Think about what you spend your time on. What are, you, what are, you, what are the thoughts in your head that keep you up when you're trying to sleep? What masters are you serving? So in, there, in that verse two, it talks about the confidence we have in eternal life. And a lot of times, when we're facing hard times, <laughs> that's one thing to say, and it's another thing to do, to have confidence that we have in God, in this eternal kind of life. Yes, for later, but also for now. And this week I heard an, another pastor on a podcast, Tim Ross. He said this, and it's been messing with me ever since. He said, if you're having trouble putting your, your confidence in God and turning over control over your life to God, just remember, that God doesn't play checkers. God plays chess. He's thinking a million moves ahead. It's not linear like che uh, checkers. One way up and one way back and simple. No, it's much more, it's a simple way to explain the complexities of God's big stories. The pieces on the board may not make sense to you right now in your life, but God's got you. If the Apostle Paul could sit across the table from you, maybe you're at a coffee shop or in your living room, he would say with all the confidence in the world and with all, he has authority to speak into this. Someone who's been beat up for Jesus, shipwrecked, uh, faced enormous challenges. He said, God had me. God's got you. Jesus is the savior of the universe. He can handle your story. And if your story isn't good right now, he's not done yet. We may not know till the other side of eternity what God was positioning. But the invitation today 
is will you trust Jesus to save you? Will you trust him to save you again? I wanna challenge you to take the first step right now. And in your heart, put, we've talked about the word allegiance. Put your hand over your heart. Maybe for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time. And just say, there's no formula to it, but just mean it in your heart. Say, Jesus, I turn over control of my life to you. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. So join me in praying that right now. Jesus, would you please make yourself real to us? Maybe some of us for the first time or, or for the first time in a long time are turning our lives over to you. God, be our Lord and Savior. Be our boss. Be our commander in chief. But God, we are trusting that you are the God these scriptures say you are reliable and trustworthy and dependable. God, we place our life in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer and you don't know what to do next, awesome. <laughs> That's very normal and natural. Please reach out to us. We'd love to come alongside of you, journey with you, and uh, give you some, some practical next steps. So reach out to us at sgbic.com and uh, we'll get back to you real soon. And, uh, and, and congratulations, if you just turned over control of your life for the first time, that is amazing. There's something cooking already. God's at work giving you a spiritual heart transplant. And continue just moment by moment, say, God, I turn over control of my life to you. So until we're together again, May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you and may God give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.